It is my privilege and joy that we can continue our Bible study in the crucible with Christ. And we have today the subtitle, Struggling with All Energy. Now, why should we struggle with all energy? Because the day of the Lord is at hand, and who shall stand when he appeareth? And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. That's how we have to be when he appears. That's why he wants to cleanse us. And we know the impurity is in a state of to be in the lie. That's impurity. And the other state is to be in the truth. That's cleanness, holiness, righteousness. So that's a state in which the spirit has to be. And now as we speak about spiritual things, it's important to have a structure by which we orient when we speak about these things. Because if you don't have a human structure, if you don't know how and where the functions of the spirit are, then we might be very confused. And that's why Christianity is not uh, successful, because we have no human model by which we have clear orientation uh, what is it about and where is the struggle, where is the battle to change from to be in the lie, to change from the state of uncleanness in the state of being clean and holy. So let us once again see the human structure in a very simple way to put it. So the human spirit has an input and an output. That is, he is a channel. There is nothing that God created that cannot be something else than a channel. That's why I have an input and output. He has needs. His motivation, his first need is love with all the other ingredients, freedom, justice, and so on. And these are needs that need to be satisfied and we have to take it from a source of need, which is outside of us. We do it by faith of what the source tells us and we do it by trust to the source that gives us the information. But we don't trust and believe to take in the power for ourselves, but in order through the will to put it into a motion. And by the will, the decision, we put the body into motion to do that, what we have been made to do. But first, we need the power to do it. So the will is at the exit of the spirit not at the entrance. So there is an entrance and an exit. And at the exit, we have the spirit, uh, we have the decision which goes into the body. And the first response of the body of our decisions are emotions. Now, emotions are the effect, the physical effect of an unknown or subconscious thought of a subconscious already made decision. That's why the uh, necessity is that we should uh, understand emotions are an effect of what we think. They are not parallel to us. But since we don't see the things I mean, we, don't, we are not aware of our thoughts, but we are aware of our emotions. We believe emotions come before thinking. That can never happen because the exit of the spirit is the entrance into the body. And emotions just uh, show what we have subconsciously thought. But then, of course, it goes into the whole body. I have to do something. I have to talk and work. So it is my spirit who speaks through the body. He gesticulates. He has certain uh, 
face uh, signs or he so that's why the body is just the instrument of the spirit in what he has to do the spirit can do nothing without the body so that's the overview of the structure now what makes the difference in the spirit what is that what determines every action of the spirit and that what it determines is identity when god created adam and eve he gave them a very clear identity by this identity without choice they trusted god and believed his word adam did not doubt god when he told him go and give names to the animals and he did not doubt God when he told him, don't eat from the tree. He believed him because that would, would be impossible. He should exist or do something with his will without first being connected to God. So the connection is made out of the spirit towards God, but it is of no choice. If you are in the truth. You can never do anything wrong. Because out of the truth that connects us only to the truth, we can never fail in our decisions. Our will is free. Our body does exactly what we want and everything works well. The only way to do something wrong is to change the state and that is to think that you are someone else than god has made you now it's evident that before something can do something it must exist so the way god made us is that we first existed and then out of our existence we exercise our works and the same thing happens with anything that what is not existent cannot act so existence comes before action the state in which the spirit is comes before he acts on it so if this uh, iPad is in a certain state it cannot function and in other good shape it can function so it's about the object how it is and our spirit, through Adam's self-deception, is just changed. He has a state in which he can only act wrongly. This is his state. If you have the state of a lie, how much truth can come out of you? So Adam and Eve, they changed their source, but they only could change the source because of changing their state first so when they doubted god when they thought they might become like god in that moment they couldn't change anything they had to do and eat from the tree as it was um, they could not stop it because the will does that what the identity trust into an identity trusted satan and people and so what they did was wrong so let us just make very plain the state of an instrument determines its function so a spirit can only be in the state of truth or in the state of a lie and as that state determines its actions, we will see what happened. So we are all born with this terrible wrong state. And we must know where does the heat, because we speak about the crucible, where does the heat set in? What should the crucible make plain? And we have seen it must come to the place where we are connected in faith and trust to our source. So the heat 
comes there. And we have at the entrance, uh, in the introduction of our study, we have that case where the author describes these two families that both families have lost a child and how they uh, mourn and the one family that uh, went over easier, even though the time of was shorter since the child passed away and the other uh, is still under the same uh, pressure and under the same uh, uh, negative thoughts and depression. Now that's how the heat comes to. Something must happen to our sources where we are bound to. That's in all cases so. So here is something that is very strange, that the mother binds her heart to the child independent to be dependent on the child is not physiological at all. The child needs to bind on mother. So if the mother would not do this wrong thing out of her wrong state, she binds herself in faith and trust to the child and the child becomes her love source. Now, when the child is passing away and disappears, she loses her strength. I mean, she loses the, the element she's bound to. So she must despair. But exactly this desperation, exactly this, this reaction must show her that something in her is wrong. So that she might understand, okay, why do I mourn? Do I mourn for the child or do I mourn for myself? All cases that I saw in my practice and wherever God sent me had the same issue. Something happened with the love source. If it was a child, if it was mother, if it was a spouse, a dog and a cat, whatever it was. It brought the one that was bound to that into disease and into uh, depression because that source where they were attached to was gone. I just this day said a patient, she's uh, my age, and she has a very strong uh, symptom of dizziness. It just affects one side of the ear and she has hypocusis. She doesn't hear well on that ear and it comes and goes and it was very strong in the last year. Now, why was this so? Because her mother, who is 80 years old, got sick and she is trying to help her mother and wants to keep her mother healthy. Now, that's not something wrong. The will wants the good. But the question is, for whom does she want the good? She wants the good for herself. Mother is there to be the, the bread she eats. And then I asked her and said, what would happen if your mother would die? And then she said, that would be a great, great catastrophe. That would be something uh, unimaginable. The mother is 80. She's 85. She's 58. Sorry. And why would she cling? And why would she be bound to her mother and believe when mother passes away that will destroy her? This is what we need to understand. Some people misunderstand the point that it is this state that uses the good thing that God put in us to use it for ourselves. And since it's all in the heart, subconsciously, we might think, well, if you don't mourn, you, are, uh, you have no feelings, you have no emotions, you are uh, cold. Not at all. He who is in love cannot be cold, cannot be indifferent. But he agrees with God because he knows that 
that child or that mother or that spouse, whoever it is, is God's possession. And being in the truth, we would not reject God's judgment. We would just trust him and say, well, what he does, he knows what he does. And so we, we would, yes, we could weep for the person, but I never found one who wept for the dead one. They wept for themselves. So here we must understand the heat must come to our source because that is subconscious to us and that must be revealed to our spirit to know it. Why? Where does the pain go when my love source is gone? Well, it must go into the body. And then the body has negative emotions. He shows negative emotions and then he shows pain and disease. So the body is the one that shows us that our state of being, the way we process things, are wrong. What is wrong? What causes pain and disease? The only thing that can do that is the will, who is trapped, who must enforce the good. So the mother would raise her child from death. The, uh, my patient would keep her mother to not die at all, to just keep her for herself. But that she does not do because she wants to. The will is trapped. He cannot do it otherwise. And whenever we are forcing the good on others, wherever we try to change something in our environment uh, that is not under our control, our body gets the wrong input, the wrong impulse. And then he shows that through negative emotions to pain and disease. So we have two things that prove that our spirit is wrong. First, we have no will to change. We are trapped. Our mind is running in a circle again and again. We cannot stop. We have no control. And this loss of control in the mind brings the body into disease, no matter what it is. So, Understanding this process will help us to know where is the battle, where is the struggle that we must go until, yes, uh, putting all into it. Is, it. is it a struggle that we should stop doing things like don't eat that, don't drink that, don't um, dress yourself like that? Uh, don't behave like that or behave like that? Is it, do we need to change our actions or do we need to change the state? What do we need to change? What is, what is that? What it is all about? Because religion and medicine do not go to change the state. They change the effect. Religion and psychotherapy, CBT, like cognitive behavioral therapy, will never change the state of the spirit. It only changes its behavior. And so the one that has a stronger will to behave well might get very well along, even under certain fires that come to the love source. But... There is some way, some extremer heat that comes then and then the will will not be able to do that. He will then go and still do its, he will eat or drink or whatever he does. He will have no control. We are not, salvation is not changing actions. That's not salvation. Salvation is changing a state of being, a state in which we are born. The instrument, the being must be changed, not the actions. 
This is why we do need to know where do we have to struggle? Where is the battle of faith? Is it in not do this or do that? For sure not. Because that's on the output. But our problem is at the input. But the input is wrong because of our state of being. So, what is the battle about? What does we need to change? I already tried to explain that. The battle is, who am I? So that's the, the focus of the battle. It's not about doings. It's about who am I? My state, my identity. And that's the issue that is all about. That is the state to be in the truth or in the lie. Who am I? That is that what matters. So where does the battle take place? How can I change something? Well, God has put in our reason the choice of grace. Our reason must understand what's wrong. If we cannot reason what's wrong, we cannot be saved. Because there must be a reason where we understand what is it about. So, reason cannot change anything, but in reason there was put the choice of grace. That is, I must see on the effect of a prisoned spirit, of an uncontrolled thinking, of negative emotions, of pain and disease of the body, I must recognize that something is wrong in my spirit. And now I must reason to see, okay, what is wrong? My actions are just effects on who I am. They are wrong, of course, if I am in the wrong state. But even if I would change my actions in the wrong state, it would not avail nothing. It would just be an even deeper deception than before. That's how religion works. That's why when Jesus came, he could not reason with them. He could not tell them, look, you are blind. He tried it. He tried in the temple to say, look, you're prisoners. And they said, no, we're not prisoners. He reasoned with them. Look to that. Then he reasoned in chapter 9 of John with the blind man born blind. In the whole Bible, this whole book was written for our reason. Because we must understand things in order to change them. It's not possible otherwise. Jesus reasoned with Peter. He reasoned with his disciples when they started to, to uh, um, want to let fire down from heaven just that they might uh, destroy that, those people that did not let them go through their uh, um, city. They just wanted to let down fire from heaven. And Jesus reasoned with them and said, do you not know which, of, uh, of the, which, re, which child you are? So here they are, they are in this state of deception and they want to destroy those people because they stand in their way. And Jesus reasons with them. You see, all his um, all his parables, all his teachings, they are not mystical. They are challenging the mind to think. They appeal to reason. So that's why it's so important that we should not think that we must uh, do certain mystical things and then things will change. No. Jesus came to the paralytic at Bethesda. He reasoned with them, do you want to be whole? He reasoned. When the lady 
who thought if I just touch his garment, I will heal. That was reason. She saw her need. She saw her desperate situation. There was no healing possible except with him. And Jesus stopped and said, let's, let's come out. I want to show that this reason that brought her to exercise faith in him as the Savior is that what matters. So I hope that is understandable. The battle is in the reason because in the heart we are closed. If God would have not given us this choice of grace in the reason or in the will where we can go against the heart because we see the deception but we cannot change it, but we have in our will, we can see the situation in which we are and the offer that Christ brings. Now, what should I choose? What is my choice? First is when I see that my state in which I am brings me here, I must crucify that state. That is, I must see that this state must be wrong. And of course, to show me that state, God uses uh, interesting analogies of letting go. And Isaiah 58 is that beautiful chapter in which the cross is described in verse 6 by these words. Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To lose the bands of wickedness? To undo the heavy burdens? What shall I lose? I lose the bands of wickedness. I must know that as a mother to be bound to the child, as the child is in the place of God, that is wickedness. Now, yes, it is an unconscious and an unwillful wickedness, but it is wickedness. When the lady is bound to her mother to want to keep her alive, to keep her healthy, and she does it because of herself. That is wickedness. That's hard for us sometimes to understand because we want the good. Yes, our will always wants the good. Paul describes it very plain in Romans 7. He says, I want the good, but look what I do. I do the wrong. I want the good. I do pressure outside uh, I try to pressure things outside of me. And who gets sick? It's my body who gets sick. So, the right fast is to acknowledge that I have to let go of that what makes me evil. And that is the state in which I am both born. Paul says, O wretched man, who I am. Who will save me from this body of death? Here is that. I must first recognize it and say I lose it. But you can never lose the bands of wickedness if you don't change the state. We'll see that. So I read further. Or lose the bands of wickedness to undo the heavy burdens. How many parents put heavy burdens on their children? How many children put heavy burdens on their parents? How many People just fight. They might not do it because they want to, but still they do the burdens on each other. And to let the oppressed go free. Why would we oppress each other? Because we think we need each other, because we think we are bound to them and we cannot live without them. That's why we have to oppress them and revenge ourselves when they when we cannot reach to them, and that he break every yoke, every yoke. So, to let go of those things is only possible if we change the state. But the first action is to crucify the state, looking where it leads you, and as an effect, the bands of wickedness 
are loosed. But we have to put something instead. It's like a coin with two sides. You cannot remove the one and doesn't take the other. So while we, the cross is first, that I understand my problem, I reason, I see that I'm bound, I want the good, but I do the wrong. Now God offers me a new life, a new state, a new tablet, to say so. It's completely new. And it can do what? It is now, it makes me free from human sources. It makes me free from human sources. And as a next, my trapped will and my enforcing and my compulsion is changed into a free will where there is no compulsion, total freedom. I let my beloved one die. I let them do what they want because God has given them that right. It's not my right to oppress them, to save them, or to lay heavy burden on them. Now, when we have this structure in front of us, we might easily understand what's written in the whole Bible, but especially there are some quotes that people are just using without uh, really know what it means. And most of them, because if you don't have a model that is absolute, then you must yeah, just be somewhere in, in, a, in a cloud. So I read from Colossians 1 from verse 26. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So how does Christ come into me? It's by taking his life that I must change my life. I don't need to change my actions. The changing of actions is a result of changing the life. The only change is the life. We will see that a little bit later. So, Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom he preach, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Well, if you have a new tablet, how will you have any defect, def defects in him? If you have a new life, this new life must be assimilated through faith and it is a perfect life in which you can do no evil, never do anything wrong. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. So how does that work? He knows that he has the new life. And through this, he goes and expels the other life. And he was put, and we have seen last time, to what extreme heat he was exposed to. And he succeeded. Because God showed in his life his freedom of being dependent on human sources. There's the other Bible verse that confuses people, which is in Philippians 2. And it is 13, 12 and 13, which also people bring, and some just read 12 and the other just read 13, and then they don't see the connection in between them. So let's read. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This is the most part that... They don't see or don't count. Then there are others that count that only, but they don't see the next one. For it is God which worketh in you both the will and to do of his, good, of his good pleasure. Now, if you don't have the clarity how a spirit works and how things work in itself, then we might think, 
we are God's robots. And he just uses our will. But you will see that's not possible. When my will becomes free, it becomes so as when Adam and Eve had his free will before he changed his state. So this leads to a free will. If I have the life of Christ, I, can, I know what I can do and what I cannot do. And what happens with my body? My body has positive emotions and is in a well-being. He's healthy. By what? By a free will. Who doesn't use any more compulsion because he has now a new life by which his actions are all correct, binding to the right source, and that is now perfect. So, having a clear structure in front of us, we know what it means to fear and tremble. So what does it mean to fear and tremble? It is to fear and tremble to be dependent from your inborn state of humans. Fear to follow your sinful nature. That's the fear. But it's not a panic, it is just a understanding that that is the issue that I must give away. And when I take the new life of Christ, it is not God who controls my will. It is I controlling my will because now I eat his food. It's not my mother anymore I eat from. It's not my child anymore I eat from. But I eat from God. And eating from God, that's how he lives in me. That's how he gives me freedom. That's how he gives me power to do with my body that for what he has made me to do. I want to finish with what is surrender. Because I see that here there are many wrong understanding of surrender. So what is surrender? We can only understand what surrender is if we understand the spheres of action. So God has this sphere of action, as we have seen in former presentations. And to man was given a sphere of action. And that sphere of action is set by God. That's my limits. And if I stay in those limits with my actions, then I never can do anything wrong and I can be, yes, growing everlastingly. But that what determines to stay in my sphere of action is my state of who I am. So as man was created like that, everything was fine. Then when he changed his state, when he thought he's a god, now his sphere of action goes beyond his limits. He must now control the life of the mother, the life of the child, the life of the spouse, the life of the dog and the cat. He must control that what is God's sphere of action. Of course, he cannot do that. It's a deception. By this, he blocks himself. That's why he gets uncontrolled. He loses his control because he wants to control that what is in God's sphere of control. Our loss of control is always the result that we want to control something that is outside of our control. That's very simple, isn't it? But it goes so fast subconsciously that we don't realize it. So the loss of control is because I try to control God's sphere of action. I try to control the sphere of action of another human, which is also God's sphere of action. I should never go into that. But my state of my spirit pushes me. It makes me to do it by all means. So what is surrender? Surrender is to give away self-deception. Surrender is to classify the renunciation of self-deception. That means to let go, let go, let go. As long as you don't renounce your self-deception, nothing will change. Now, of course, we have seen that you replace it with Christ, but as surrender is to replace, to renounce of self-deception and remaining in one's own sphere of action, that is coming back to the original state of which God made man. 
So surrender is never something what you... I mean, surrender no, never goes to a surrender of something that is good. We only surrender the evil. Never the good. Never the good. We never let go of the truth. How should we? But we let, have to go let go of iniquity. So surrender. That's why when we read Steps to Christ, that book of E.G. White, we, and we know the human structure, then it all makes sense what she writes. She says, some people think it's a great thing to give up everything. Well, what is it to give up everything? It is to give up that which controls everything that is the state of self-deception. In it, all evil is concluded because all evil comes from that state. So that's why she says, what do I have to give to God that is good? We never can give anything good to God. Everything we give to God is evil. So God calls us to renounce that. And he gave us that choice in our reason, our will, is the one that must reason and say, okay, I want to get out of that state and exchange my state with the life of Christ. So that's real surrender. Now I want also to explain what surrender is not. What's the wrong surrender? Because things look very similar. Most people surrender that which cannot be surrendered. That is giving up self-control in my sphere. They want to give up the self-control they have to have. The Bible is very plain. We must control our mind. We must control our thoughts. We must control the way we work. So God has given us our sphere of action that should never be surrendered. That should always stay under our uh, administration. We do it because it's our sphere of action. He will never come in between because that's how he made us. And what surrender is not to require from God to take over my sphere of action. That's mostly what people understand of surrender. That's why they think they have to surrender their works. They have to surrender uh, the good things. All those things that God has given to man, his sphere of action, doesn't require to be surrendered because that you must control. In that sphere, you have your own responsibility and no one can take your responsibility over. You must exercise it. So I hope we understand the wrong and the right surrender. And we understand the human structure, so that we can experience it in our lives and to be able to share it with those around us. Because they live in the darkness of an unknowledge, of not knowing the human being, not knowing what is wrong. But we as Christians should know exactly what is wrong. And since I once knew that the wrong, the thing is wrong with the object in the spirit state of his mind is wrong, then of course I also go to that point. Because I know it from beginning. It's in all human beings the same thing. And I offer to everyone a new, a new life, a new state of being. That we can all only take over through faith. But before we exercise that faith, we must reason that that is the right thing to do. And we might even go against our tendency. But reason must bear this way. We must know that is right, and I do it if it kills me. That's how we have to do it. And that we can only do if we have exchanged our lives. Out of the life of Christ, we can never do a mistake. He who is born from above cannot sin. So let us ponder and deepen 
our understanding and know for sure the battle is not in the output, at the output. It's not in our works. Our work just confirm our state because they are the result of our trust and of our belief. And that is in whom? So let us be very clear. We have one problem and one solution. We are born in the wrong state. We must give that state off up consciously and we must see in the new life our only hope and out of that we may, may say the same word like Paul said I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me Amen